Look at that. That's nice, isn't it? Oh, it's not nice. It's better than that, isn't it? I'm going to need my dictionary. Let's see. Al. L-O-V-E. Lovely. Lovely. Oh, no, no, no. It's much better than that. Let's go to C. C U T C U T E. They are so cute. Oh no, I've said it. Welcome to Spring Watch. Hello. Hello and welcome to Spring Watch 2021. We're into week three, our final week, I'm afraid, coming to you live from Wild Ken Hill up on the northwest coast of Norfolk. Been here for a couple of weeks. Things have been going quite well. I think we've had some quite exciting things. Great science. Mm -hmm. Those aquatic insects full of omega-3, that was good. What about the marsh harrier taking the leveret? Oh, that was amazing. Astonishing stuff, mm. but like, we can guarantee you plenty more wildlife action this week because we are at such a fantastic place and our cameras have been out around the clock here at Wild Ken Hill. There's lots of farmland, but this is farmland that's looking for a vision for our future. Lots of proactive, regenerative farming going here. It's already paying dividends for wildlife, of course. Down on the coast, they've got their marsh. Traditional conservation, that's paying off as well. And of course, it's not just about the big things, the waders, it's about all the insects that come too, like this resplendent electric blue broad-bodied chaser. That's the male. And we've got some other chasers here, egg laying, delicately dipping their abdomens down into the water each time leaving a little egg. What about that? Fantastic things, dragonflies. Been around for more than 300 million years. They can fly at 30 miles an hour, some perhaps even faster. Brilliant. As Chris said, this is a most amazing place and it's huge. It's 4,000 acres and that's given us the opportunity to get our cameras on lots of different nests. Currently got them on 13 nests. 30 cameras our nest watchers have to watch. These are just some of them, and I know you've been looking at them at the weekend as well online. And look, if you look in there, you can see we've got some still on eggs, some on chicks. Some of those nests are even empty. And on Friday, we told you to look out for, oh, there must have been at least four nests that had eggs in that might hatch. And Chris and I put a little bit of a wager on. And you bet on which one hatching first? I bet you this pound yeah. of the Queen's sterling currency that the lapwings would hatch first. And I guess that the skylarks would hatch first. So there's only one way to find out who wins the pound. And it's to see what went on over the weekend. So, Saturday morning, the sun rose. Let's take a look at our two contenders. First of all, we've got the lapwing sitting comfortably and looking calm and confident on her four eggs, that beautiful sky behind. The skylark wanders in, relaxes on her nests and broods her four. But which one was the first to hatch? 1422, the lapwing gets up, something is going on. One of the eggs is pipping. It's an early start in the race and it looks promising, but will it be the first to hatch? 15.54, our Skylark looks restless. Is something going to happen? Let's go back to the Lapwing. 16.47, the Lapwing, not much action. Still at the pipping stage, not looking like a winning hatching to me, Chris. But if we go back to our Skylark at 17.18, something has clearly happened. And yes, the Skylark chicks have pipped the pipping Lapwing to the post and are the first to hatch. And you can see the adult taking the eggs out. And by 1735, you can see the little beats there. And I can tell you now, Chris, that the lapwing chick didn't show its face until the next morning. So I am indeed the winner. And the Skylarks were the first to hatch. I think you have to agree. Well, I don't, actually, as a matter oh, of fact. Oh, what no, a I, surprise. I, I, I don't, not in any way, shape or form. <laughs> Why I, not? I think that, for me, hatching, the initiation of that process, is indicated by the pipping of the egg. Well, I would disagree. I'd say it's the first chicks to actually hatch. And you can see, by Sunday morning, all four chicks very happily hatched and being fed by the parents. So, 
I think well, no, no, you've no, got to no, pay no, it over. I think there's only one way to reconcile this difference of opinion, and that is to go to the Committee of Official Egg Hatching, <laughs> based in Geneva in Switzerland, and we'll have to take their qualified answer before you get your grubby hands on this pound coin, which you can't have anyway due to COVID regulations, so it's staying <laughs> firmly in my pocket, Well, I do think that social media might be our jury, and they will judge who was the winner there, the lapwing or the skylark, and I think you'll all have to agree with Let's me, Let's go actually. live to the skylarks now, though, to see how they are getting along. There we are. You can see the youngsters in the nest. How many were there, Mick? There were four. Four in there. Now, I can't say that they're looking a picture of how, but I've no reason to suspect otherwise. We just can't see much activity at the moment, but we have been watching the adults backwards and forwards, f you know, feeding them. They've been really studious when it comes to brooding them as well, and their job at the moment is just to crouch down in that nest and remain hidden. Let's go live to the lap wing, though, to see what is happening at that nest. We know they've gone. All that remains now are those telltale eggshells left on the ground, and they would, of course, draw in any predators. That's why that female lap wing wanted to get her chicks away from that area, into that thick cover as quickly as possible. But another nest that we were watching last week, which was proving quite mysterious, a bit of an enigma, was our shell duck. And that is an enigma because we couldn't actually see the nest. We'd put an endoscope down this old foxhole at the base of a tree, and we'd seen the breast feathers of the adult, which we presumed were covering the eggs. But as we saw at the top of the program, that brood has made it out of there, which is great. But having said that, the site is still getting some attention. Look at this, after dark, something came prowling. Look at the pointed ears, the beautiful pointed nose, and the velvet feet of the fantastic Mr. Fox. The question is, has Mr. Fox arrived too late to score a hit with any of those shell ducks, or is there still a potential threat? Find out more later in the programme a little bit of jeopardy and we will be catching up with that story and all the other stories that happened over the weekend as you can see there's been a lot of action but you guys have also been out and enjoying the sunshine sending us your pictures including this i love this this is from helen and eddie mccallan and look at these couple of beavers frolicking in the grass they're tayside beavers and they're now a free-ranging species so really lovely to see them out especially in daylight We've got our own beavers here at Wild Ken Hill as well, actually. There's a 50-acre enclosure not too far from where we're standing. There are four animals in there. Not in the wild. They are enclosed at the moment. It's part of a, a trial that's going on here. We've been inside. They're still quite shy at the moment, but we did get this glimpse of them coming up on the surface of their lake, and we'll be showing you a lot more of these animals, we hope, during autumn and winter watch. Whilst in the enclosure, we found this, though, one of the most delightful things that you can keep your eyes open for at this time of year. It's a lovely little fox cub, which has got its den in there somewhere. And do remember, of course, that you can watch all of our live cameras from 10 o'clock in the morning until 10 o'clock at night for the remainder of this week. And to do that, you need to visit our website. So we've given you fluffy chicks, we've given you cute fox cubs. Yellow in Scotland, are you going to top that for us? Michaela, easy, absolutely simple. All I have to do is mention two words, wildcat kittens, and the whole nation is going to melt. It's been a lovely weekend and the wildcat kittens have been out and about stretching their legs getting a little bit bigger, a little bit more confident each day and starting to, to play fight now, which is nice to see, honing their hunting skills. And we'll be catching up, not just with those kittens, but with the wildcat breeding project later on this week. And over in Northern Ireland, Gillian, well, Gillian has bitten her nails to the quick. Yes, well, it's been an emotional roller coaster here with Betty, the black headed girl. The end of last week, we thought it was all over. We have a live camera on Betty at the moment. Let's take a look at what she is up to. Now, remember, last week she lost all her chicks in a predation event. And just a few hours ago, this is what we saw. Betty's still on the nest there, but as she adjusts herself, stands up she reveals that she has now laid two eggs now this is quite early on in the season so we thought she might lay again so we kept our cameras on and it came good so amazingly here we are 
the beginning of our last week at Castle Espy, and Betty is back. So that's exciting news from Castle Espy, and I'm sure there's more exciting news from Wild Ken Hill. We love that. Betty bounces back. <laughs> and I remember Betty bounces back from the title of a film that I found whilst grubbing around in my uncle's wardrobe in the 1970s. It was a film I was never allowed to watch. Fantastic stuff, fantastic stuff there. Should we have a look at our live camera? Let's see if we've got anything on one of our live cameras. Well, what have we got down there? Well, there's a lapwing down on the marsh. Now, they have been showing... Oh, we've got grey lag goose behind there. It's been a hot bed of activity, although the marsh is drying out a little bit at the moment. We need some more rain to top that up. Looking very different to when we first possible. arrived a couple of weeks ago when there was so much rain. Chris, there's already been some comments coming in on social media with our <laughs> hatching contest between the Skylark and the Lapwing, but some people want a little bit more evidence, which I understand, so we're going to give you some Lapwing evidence. We showed that egg pipping, and that was on Saturday at 14.22, and then we don't know what time they actually hatched, but two of them had hatched by 5 a.m. on Sunday morning. 5.14, the third one started to pip, and by 5.47, you can see there are three chicks there. Now, at this stage, they're looking very damp, but it doesn't take long before Mum comes back. Looks like she's going to remove that hatched egg, leaves it there, settles down on top of those chicks. At this stage, they need a little bit of warmth and they need to dry off. And just look how quickly they do dry off. I mean, that's an hour and a half later, I suppose. And you can see they're dry, they're fluffy, and a lot more capable. They're wandering around a little bit around the nest. It's really important that they leave that nest as quickly as possible to avoid being predated. And so the adult calls them off, and by 10, 11, they've gone. But what about that fourth egg? What happened to that? Well, this is about at least five hours after the first two hatched. And that last egg, the fourth egg, starts to pop out. The chick is starting to pop out of the egg. Now it's not looking so great, it's got flies on it, but it is alive and it is moving. You can hear the mum is calling. The mum knows there's a fourth chick in there and is trying to get it to join the other three. It's looking very wobbly on those legs. But its instinct is to go towards that adult that's calling it. And it's trying desperately hard to stagger off that nest and get to its calling parent. Slowly but surely, it gets a little bit of strength and it manages to go towards the call. And that's where we're going to leave that story there so we can believe that that little chick lived happily ever after. Well, I think you could be right. Really? Well, it's a nice warm day. It's got up, it's out and about. The sun will dry it out. If it's found the security of the, of the grass there, it may meet up with the adult and its three siblings. Really? You really think that? No, sucker! Oh, sucker! No! <laughs> Listen, I'm prepared to wage you the same pound that I still have firmly in my pocket on the future of that little lapwing <laughs> No, you're so mean. I actually believed you for a second there. Enough of Wild Ken Hill. Let's head over to Northern Ireland to Gillian. She's based herself at Carthel Air. SB Wildfowl and Wetland Trust Centre, where they not only engage themselves with trying to look after UK species, but also some exciting exotics as well. <laughs> that is right, as well as the wild side of Castle SB, where there's also a breeding programme here, like Chris said, to help not just UK species, but also exotic species from right around the world. Now, although this is a reserve, it's still a really dangerous place to raise a family. And just a few days ago, we witnessed one of many mass predation events here on the reserve. Now, lesser black back gulls, but also the occasional greater black back gull, will cruise over these colonies at this time of year. They know there are easy pickings. Now, these are birds, big birds, much bigger than the black-headed gulls. So they simply overpower, outgun those black-headed gulls. And they just stand no chance as the blackbacks head off with the chicks. And it causes a big stir. You can hear that noise as all the black-headed gulls will try and chase it off, but obviously in that case to no avail. 
Now, to prevent the chicks from some of the more sensitive species that are here on the reserve, they have a monitoring and a breeding program here, the team here at Castle Lesby. So the wardens here will go out on daily trips. You can see Alex here, one of the wardens, on an egg collecting trip around the reserve with her bucket there. She'll inspect the nests quickly, making as little fuss as possible. That one there was empty. And she'll move right round the reserve, really methodically. Now this nest here isn't got real eggs, it's got wooden eggs. Those are replacements, so as she takes the real eggs, she puts dummy eggs in there so that it doesn't distress the female, and she brings the real eggs back to this incubation center where it's kept in very, very precise conditions. They're turned regularly, but they're also inspected regularly. So Alex uses this torch here to shine, illuminate what's going on inside that egg. And you can see this network of blood vessels there, the developing embryo, but a much older chick, developing chick inside the egg. When you shine that torch inside, you can see a distinct line there. That's the air sac that's developing inside the egg. And if you can really check carefully, you'll see the actual beak of the chick. So let's take a look, a closer look, at what is actually going on inside that egg. Now it begins like this, this little disc of cells here will be the sort of unspecialized early cells. They will start to divide rapidly and specialize within a few hours, a distinct head end and tail end will be visible. When in a few days, the eye starts to form and also a network of blood vessels and the blood vessels are connected to the yolk and that's how it nourishes the growing embryo. Now as this embryo grows, that yolk will shrink but this air sac here will start to grow until finally you've got almost a fully developed chick, a tiny little smidge of, embryo, of yolk there and this massive air sac here. And when the chick is ready to hatch out, it will puncture through into that air sac and will actually take its first breaths inside the egg itself. And it's only when the carbon dioxide levels inside that air sac start to rise that it prompts the chick to break through and hatch out. So once the chicks have hatched out, where do they go next? Well, they go to an area called the indoor duckery. Now, the indoor duckery looks almost as fun as it sounds. There's lots of environment enrichment, it's called there, those toys in there for the developing chick. This is a cinnamon teal in there. And of course it's kept warm, but more importantly, it's kept safe from predators until it's big enough to be released back out onto the reserve. So, like I said, the work here at Wild, the Wildfowl and Wetland Trust and also other reserves right across the country is really important in conservation projects, not just for UK species, but for species that are on the brink of extinction worldwide. Really, really important work and testament to a job well done. So for now, let's join someone else who is never, never gets bored of his job. Sound recordist Gary Moore went out on a bracing walk earlier this spring armed with his trusty parabolic, a bow and arrow, and a felt cap. Just north of Nottingham, this is arguably our most famous ancient woodland of all, Sherwood Forest. It's a sound recorded dream at any time of the year, but come spring, it awakens from its slumber and comes alive with a symphony of wild sound. Okay, so I don't have my merry men with me today, but what I do have is my trusty parabolic reflector. And I'm gonna act a little bit like Robin Hood in the fact that I'm gonna try and capture the riches of this springtime forest and distribute it to the nation. With only 2.4% of the UK's ancient woodland cover left, my senses go into overdrive, wondering if these sounds are as they were centuries ago. And at this time of year, the soundscape is at its very best. There are a couple of really nice benefits to birding in early spring. One is the fact that there are no leaves on the tree, so it benefits identification in the birds, but also a leafless tree doesn't interfere with the audio, so I get cleaner, crisper sound from the species that are in the tops of the trees. And as I walk deeper into the forest, there's one unmistakable sound resonating through the woodland.
That was the drumming of the greatest spotted woodpecker. This is one of the most common woodpeckers in the UK, and it's the one you're most likely to hear in your local woodland or park. So basically what that bird's doing is it's staking a claim to its territory, and both sexes do it, males and females both drum. The great thing about woodpecker species in the UK is they've got lots of sexual dimorphism, you can tell them apart. The males have a red patch on the back of their head, while the females don't. And if you spot one with a flash on the top, well, that's the juvenile. This time of year, these birds are really territorial, and that drumming is just staking a claim to its territory, saying, this is where I live, go away, basically. I'm going to try and close the gap down a little bit. Some people think about snowdrops, some people think about primroses, but for me, it's the drumming of the woodpecker. God, that's nice, that's real spring. The dead wood in these ancient woodlands provide the woodpecker with a wealth of food and nesting opportunities. But ancient forests aren't just about woodland. Pockets of heathland exist within it too, just as they would have done centuries ago. And although the soundscape is different, another woodpecker can be heard on the heath. So what I've been hearing for the last half an hour is a green woodpecker somewhere out here on the heath. The green woodpecker is a feeder of ants, so it's a ground feeder, so it spends more time in this open habitat. Traditionally, you won't hear them drumming, or they do drum, but it's really, really rare. You hear that characteristic yaffle, which is what I've been hearing here this morning. And much like the great spotted woodpecker, you can easily tell the females apart. The males have a distinctive red flash on the side of their face. As I go out and about every day recording, right, as soon as I put these headphones on, I no longer live in the visual world. For me, it's all about the sound. So even though I've not seen that green woodpecker, I know it's there because it's given away its presence by its call, and that's what's important to me. And it's not the only music to my ears. Just as I'm heading back into the forest, one of my all-time favourite sounds grabs my attention. That is a fantastic display flight. And it really is a beautiful bird. It's a woodlark, and they leave a perch and they do a little display flight, like that one there. <laughs> what a fantastic song. Few ancient woodlands like this remain, but this is one of the places that we can say with some certainty that these sounds have resonated throughout the air here for hundreds and hundreds of years. This is why I never get bored of my job, and I always enjoy listening to the sounds of spring. Gary Moore, what a bloke. <laughs> we love Gary. Gary is absolutely fantastic, and we share his passion for the woodlark. And I'm very pleased to say that we've got a camera on a woodlark's nest here. We can go to it live now. So here's our little woodlark down on the ground there. You can see the young, just like those skylarks we were looking at earlier, actually. You can just see the down in the nest there. Their job, again, is just to stay absolutely motionless, waiting for the adults to come in and feed them, which they've been doing very dutifully and very readily, I have to say. The thing about these woodlark is it's a treat to see them. There's 1.6 million pairs of skylark in the UK, but there are only 2,300 woodlark. In the 1980s, they were down to just over 200. The reason for the increase, well, one of the reasons was that quite close to here in Thetford Forest, at that time, a load of post-war forestry, non-native plantations, was clear -failed. They were cut down completely, which can look a bit dramatic and destructive and ugly, 
woodlarks loved it. That open ground was perfect for them. They're quite fussy, aren't they? I mean, they do need a bit of diversity. So let's just quickly show you on this map what they need. They need something to eat, so they need low vegetation so that they can get insects and spiders and seeds. They need a tussocky sort of area, a bit more sort of sedgy so they, they can lay their eggs. They're ground nesting birds, remember? They need somewhere quiet because they're ground nesting birds. Obviously, they can't have lots of people or dogs trampling on them or the eggs. And they need trees so they can perch in there so they can sing. So these are all the things they need need. They need about four hectares. That's the area that is suitable for our woodlarks. And obviously they're in a green area, so it's on, it's on the green list. So it's the perfect package deal here at Wild Ken but Hill. What makes it the perfect package deal? Because this, remember, was a farm. They're now doing a lot of great work with wildlife, but you need to do a bit more for woodlark. And it's their rewilding endeavour that's really paying dividends here because they've turned out, you know, domestic stock on the land here to do the job that wild herbivores would have been doing at some stage in the past. So they've got herds of cows out here and they wide, uh, range widely over that habitat. They've also got groups of pigs shuffling around, turning over the soil, breaking that open, and woodlarks love bare soil for foraging. And they've also got a herd of Exmoor ponies out here as well. Now, all of these animals are herbivores, but they're all doing different things to that environment. They're modifying it in a way which is natural. And at this point in time, not forever, but at this point in time, it's perfect for these woodlarks. But whilst we're on these domestic animals, we have to acknowledge a little mistake that we made last week, because we did infer in one of our films that horses chewed the cuds and they were ruminants. Well, we knew that they weren't, of course. This was something that was a mishap in the edit when we changed the film around. So we apologise for that, of course, but I would like to add one note. We'd love to be corrected, and we're always happy. I particularly put my hand up and say we got that wrong, but we like to be corrected in a polite way. Just bear that in mind. <laughs> um, so, going back to our woodlark, we had a lot of questions, actually, which really good questions about why do some birds decide to nest on the ground and others in trees, and it's all to do with avian evolution. Um, some birds have just evolved to be ground nesters, some have evolved to be in the trees. And if we, first of all, take our woodpecker, it's obviously a tree nesting bird. It puts a lot of energy into making its nest, which is a hole in a tree. Obviously, they've got to think, the main thing they think about is let's avoid predation. Let's think of somewhere warm and let's make sure there's plenty of food availability. So this is a nest that's pretty protected. Not always. We have in the past seen stoats go in there. But obviously, that's unusual. We haven't seen that very often. So that is a protected nest. One brood, it puts all its energy into those particular chicks. We can contrast that with a ground nesting bird by going back to our woodlarks, of course. Now, they choose to nest on the ground because they firstly have to be close to where their food is. And they like short turf to walk around in. They don't like long grass. They can't walk through that to find their insects. So here's a woodlark out on that short turf. because they don't want to make a nest there. It'd be too easy to find. So they need that. Uh, longer growth towards the edge of the woodland where they hide their nest on the ground. But a striking difference between the woodlark and the woodpecker, as Michaela says, the woodpecker just has one clutch of eggs, one brood, with a lot of investment, and they are much slower developing birds. The woodlark, by contrast, starts breeding in March and by the end of the summer could have had three broods and its youngs progress much more quickly. So we can get them out and if they fail, have another go. If they fail, have another go. And another strategy, without getting into too much detail, think back to that lapwing. Nesting on the ground, massive eggs. 11% of the female's body weight each time one is laid. Bigger egg, better development in the eggs, and we've seen those youngsters scarpering into cover. So again, another adaptation for ground nesting. And remember that basically all of our birds started nesting on the ground when all of our birds so long ago were dinosaurs. It's so interesting though, isn't it, how things evolve. But some birds are actually quite confused. They should be on the ground and yet they sort of halfway up a tree. And um, I think you found a bird that's a bit confused and breaking all the rules, haven't you, Yolo? 
Yes, I have indeed, Michaela. It's, uh, it's very odd, really, and it's probably our commonest bird up here, and it's the willow warbler. If you look, we have these wonderful birch woodlands here, and they are hooching with willow warblers. You go for a walk through them, see the birds everywhere. When we arrived, they were, they were nest building. This is a bird with grass for its nest, looking around, make sure it's not followed. And this is the nest itself. It's hidden away in amongst some tall vegetation, bracken and moss in this instance, and that is a typical willow wobbler. It is what you would expect. But just 30 meters away from that nest, I found a willow wobbler nest that was six foot up a birch tree. It's hidden amongst some of the small branches in this tree, difficult to see from afar, but we had a cameraman in a hide 10 meters away and he watched the bird. It's either turning over the eggs or maybe rearranging some of the vegetation in there. And this is very, very unusual. I've been looking at birds, finding birds nests for 45 years, and this is the first time I've ever found a willow warbler nest that high up a tree. Usually it's on the floor or near the floor. So what's going on? Well, we're not quite sure, but what we believe is that the densities here are so high that nest sites are at a premium, and that pair has had to look elsewhere. No reason why they shouldn't succeed. That actually looks like a really good place for them to nest. Now, there's another bird that looks a lot like the willow warbler, and that is the chiff chaff. And during the first week, you might have seen we had a camera on a chiff chaff nest. Now, it's a, it's a similar nest, almost like a wren's nest, a little dome nest on the floor there. And it's a very, very similar bird, too. You could easily confuse the two birds. So the big question is, how on earth do you tell the difference between a willow warbler and a chiff chaff? Well, this is what the books tell you. The books will point out a variety of different things. Amongst them will be the legs. This looks simple, doesn't it? Willow warbler, pinkish legs, and then the chiff chaff here has got dark legs. One of the other things the books always point out is that the willow warbler has a very distinctive line through the eye there. But a word of warning, they vary a lot. And I've seen, I've seen willow warblers with dark legs, I've seen chiff chaffs with light colored legs. And as Chris said in the first week, one of the few ways you can be sure is if you're out with an experienced bird ringer, they can open the wing and they can show you the number and arrangement of feathers there. But there is another way, and that's a much simpler way as well. Use your ears and listen to the song. Listen to this, this is the willow warbler. Hear that lovely little descending song with a little flurry at the end? Now, listen to the chiff chaff, very different. Hear that? Chiff chaff, chiff chaff, it's an onomatopoeic bird. In other words, the bird says its own name. It tells you exactly what it is. Chiff chaff, chiff chaff. So when you're out and about, you see a little green bird and you think, hmm, I'm not sure which one that is. Just stop and listen, and that will be a big help for you. Now, if you live on the coast, if you go snorkeling, if you go diving, you may well have come across a group of creatures that look as if they've come from another planet. Now, these are creatures most people don't even know exist. And if you think they look weird, their lifestyle and their behaviour is odder still. Hidden beneath the waves, in the dappled light of the shallows, Furtive fumblings and dark deeds are being perpetrated by some very strange characters. Relatives of the snail, sea slugs are soft-bodied mollusks that lack an external shell. With no protection from big jaws, sharp claws or a protective shell, these soft little creatures seem defenceless. but appearances can be deceiving. Sea slugs have evolved special superpowers in order to survive. Meet Elysia viridis, Latin for heavenly green. Right now, this diminutive little beast 
doesn't quite live up to its name. But it's on the hunt for a meal which will transform its life. Algae, a veritable banquet of it. As it feeds, it does something remarkable. It steals vital components from within the algae's cells. Green chloroplasts. Rather than digest them, Elysia absorbs them into its own body intact. And the little brown thief ends up with a coat of green. The stolen chloroplast grant Elysia the superpower of photosynthesis. Now drawing energy from the heavens above, this sneaky solar-powered slug can go for up to 12 weeks without eating. But this isn't the only trick in Elysia's armory. As its parapodial wings unfold, they reveal a magical leaf-like disguise. Totally transformed, the heavenly green sea slug can now bask in the full glory of its name. But this sea slug has competition for its superpower status. Meet Eolidia papillosa, the shagrug sea slug. It hungers for sea anemones. Living fortresses armed with stinging cells, nematocysts, which anemones use to paralyze their prey. But far from being deterred by these venomous creatures, the shagrug attacks them. The anemone's sting has little effect on this sea slug. In a bid to retreat, the anemone detaches itself from its perch and draws in its tentacles. But the speedy shag rug knocks the loose anemone over the edge. Damaging, but not deadly, the sea slug protrudes a set of jaws out of its mouth, which rasp away at the base of the anemone. What comes next? is quite astonishing. The shagrug can steal the stinging cells from the anemone. It absorbs them and passes the anemone's stinging cells into its own bodily projections, giving this supercharged slug a paralyzing sting of its own. The power to absorb living biological assets directly from their food or prey is a very sneaky trick, which helps explain why sea slugs are, in fact, a very successful and diverse group of animals. Britain is home to more than 100 species of sea slug. These biological burglars have evolved a plethora of amazing adaptations and sneaky survival skills. They are a family not to be underestimated. I just love that. The fact that these weird and wonderful creatures just in the shallow coastal waters off the British coast. But what about the creatures of the deep? Well, today is World Ocean Day. It's a day that helps us to focus our attention on protecting our oceans, celebrating our oceans. And of course, this is a great chance to take a deep dive into some of the deep sea waters off the British coast. So let's take a look at what I'm talking about here. So the island of Ireland is perched on the western edge of a continental shelf, a vast continental shelf, this area here called the Celtic Shelf. And all along the ridge there, plunges into deep water up to 5,000 meters deep. And just imagine this, this is thousands and thousands of miles of undersea cliffs with canyons and ridges and of course, lots of creatures that have remained a mystery to us until now. 
Now, in the waters off the Irish coast, a number of expeditions have explored this continental shelf, funded by the Irish government and the European Maritime Fisheries Fund. It's led by the Marine Institute, and it's a project called Sea Rover, working at depths of down to 3,000 meters. Now, this is Holland One. It's a remotely operated vehicle, and it's been used in a series of expeditions to gather samples from the seabed using these robotic arms. Now, just this is way past the depth of where any light might reach the seabed. So without the ROV's lights there, it is pitch black. But there is life, and life that is sustained by marine snow. A detritus, this sediment that filters down from the surface of the water and provides vital nutrients for all sorts of creatures, bottom feeders, filter feeders, and scavengers. And of course, where there are filter feeders and scavengers, the predators surely follow. So the team at the National University of Ireland, Galway's Centre for Ocean Research and Exploration, have shared this incredibly rare footage with us. This is a deep sea octopus, Granelodon vericos, called that because of its ridges, but also other species, Mus octopus, Johnsonianus, recorded at depths from between 1800 to 2500 metres. And this is restricted to the eastern North Atlantic, this species, and it's seen here on a deep sea coral reef. This is absolutely extraordinary footage. You can just make out the anemones there. And then possibly the strangest thing, Storotuthis ceratensis. Now this is an octopus as well with webbed arms. And it uses those webbed arms to move through the water. So the Holland one, that ROV, has seen so many of these incidental isolated organisms in these very vast featureless seabirds but every now and again it came across a hive of activity the black mouth cat shark shoaling at depths of 750 meters that's almost a kilometer deep this is absolutely extraordinary footage now these are the older individuals they'll congregate around these deep coral reefs they serve as a focal point for these gatherings. And now the reef may be a thousand years old, so these scenes may be millennia old, unchanged. And what are the sharks doing here? Well, they're laying their eggs. You can see those olive green egg cases in amongst the skeletons, the white skeletons of sea urchins. It's just magical, magical scenes to think that these cameras trained in the deep sea are revealing all these mysteries. So cameras trained on the deep sea, but with Chris and Michaela, they've got their cameras trained on their nests. So let's join them at Wild Ken Hill. Thanks, Gillian. I've got to say, what a remarkable time to be alive with all that technology at our disposal, to be able to get to those areas where we could never reach and see these remarkable organisms. It's amazing. I think that there's so much that we still don't know that's underneath the water. Right, time to catch up with what happened over the weekend. There was a lot of activity. And for those of you watching on social media, I think the absolute highlight for so many was when our shell ducks hatched and left their burrow. So this is what happened on Sunday morning at 9.05. The mother came out and you can clearly see those adorable little chicks. You can hear the mum calling, so they've got to come out of that burrow and follow their mum. And they've got to get to water. Now, we had no idea how many eggs were in that burrow. Obviously, we can't see them. But we had a guess, probably about anything between 8 and 11, maybe. And you can see there's the male and the female. In fact, there are three ducks there. One is the mother, one is the father, and the other one seems to be an interloper that the dad tries to chase off, keeps coming back. So our nest watchers diligently counted these chicks. Not an easy thing to do. I'm sure some of you are trying to do it right now. But by stopping and pausing, we know that there were 11 chicks that came out. And there we go. We've got the parents leading them off. Now, we did last week see how far it was from that burrow to the water. And it's 860.8 metres. So this is quite a long and treacherous journey. 
and you can see the obstacles that those little tiny fluff balls have got to get over. And they're escorted all the way by both of the parents. They've got to go over the fields and make their way to the marsh. And you can see there's still that third one hanging around, which is interesting and something we're going to talk about. But you can see there, they all waddle off after mum and dad and they finally get to the water. And by the time they did get to the water, they actually only managed to count 10 of them. Now, obviously, I'm not going to do a Disney ending on this. We don't know what happened to that last one. Maybe it got lost. Maybe it was there. We didn't see it. Maybe it did get predated. But considering it was such a long way for them to go, if they lost one between that burrow and the water, then that's pretty much a success story. It's a fantastic success story. Great to see them getting to the security of the marsh down there. But what about the burrow? If you think back over the last couple of weeks, we've seen the coming of goings of not just one female shelter up there, but others. So it wasn't all over. Look at this. We saw other animals coming back to the burrow. Now this one, look at its behavior. Walks straight up and goes straight down the hole disappears into the hole. A short while later, a second bird appears. And look at this, it's much more tentative, much more nervous. Ignore the feathers that it's got stuck on its beak that's just been doing a bit of preening and it's mildly embarrassing. But as you can see, it's much slower going in and out. And it doesn't stay in very long. It has a little look round and then relatively quickly that bird comes back out of the nest hole and disappears quite quickly. But then it's a long time before the original bird that we saw re-enter there comes back out again. That bird's been under the ground for a long time. Now, you've seen a difference in behaviour there, which was quite discernible, but there are physical differences between these birds as well, and we'd already noted that. Let's have a look. On the left-hand side of your screen here, you've got the original female. That's the one that's led her brood down to the marsh. The other two birds are these birds which are still coming back to the nest. The one in the middle, the one that's spending a lot of time down there. The other one which is nipping in and out. So what is going on here? Well, we've applied some more new technology. I'm very pleased to say that we're using some artificial intelligence. Robert a bank. Uh, Robert Dawes from BBC Research and Development has plugged in some software to our uh, to our cameras so that we can see that these animals are going in and out and time it perfectly. And what we've discovered from that, a little bit of graphical representation here, is this. One of those animals is spending an enormous amount of time nipping out for a short bit and going back in. The other bird we saw, the tentative one, is just popping in and looking. I think, Michaela, this leads me to believe that this bird has another clutch of eggs and is continuing to incubate them down there under the ground. Do you know what I think is absolutely fascinating is, you know, we try to find out as much information as we could from experts and there's so little information because they're so hard to study because they are underground. So what we are learning from the AI and from the nest watchers watching them is so much new information. Um, so we're able to sort of collate all that and work things out. I mean, it is it's it's new stuff. stuff. It's groundbreaking In fact, info. Some of the people who've been studying shell ducks are so excited about what we've seen, they've suggested that we write it up and submit it as a small scientific paper. So we're going to be encouraging Jack and Henry, some of our leading ornithologists here, to be doing that when the series finishes, which would be fantastic. But I think your theory might be right, actually. I think there might be one of the females down there with more eggs. And if that is the case, then that fox that we showed you earlier could be a problem. So here it is from behind the tree. You can see a fox comes out. We've seen very few foxes around the area, but this one is clearly interested in that burrow. Now, this was after our chicks left. So as we say, there may be more chicks down there. We just don't know. But the fox is sniffing. So whether it's sniffing the chicks that have just left and the smell's still there, or whether it's, it knows that there's more chicks in there that are going to come out, we just won't know. I don't think though, I mean, we know how deep that is. That's 2.6 meters, because we put an endoscope down there. I don't think the fox is gonna actually get down there to well, see it. Well, it could get it, down there. Do you reckon? No, I think it's an old fox earth. I think that, you know, it's 
been it's been down there previously. I think it would fit. It's a question of whether it wants to go down and confront one of those shell ducks head on. Well, we will keep our eyes on that burrow to see what happens. And gosh, won't it be amazing if we do see more chicks come out? OK, enough from Wild Ken Hill for the moment. Let's head north again for the final time this evening and join Yolo Williams, who's at the Allerdale Wilderness Reserve. Yolo. Yes, indeed, Chris. And it's a beautiful place. And you can see why I love it here. It's got everything that I like. You know, it's got the mountains, it's got the moorland, it's got this stunning broadleaf birch woodland here and it's got Scottish midges that don't like Welsh blood so it's a win-win for me up here. Last week we introduced you to Hander Island, a Scottish wildlife trust reserve just 40 miles northwest of here and it's only a 10 minute trip by boat. I know that because over the weekend I nipped across in some stunning weather at a warm welcome and had a fantastic time there. And we also introduced you to some of the birds that you're likely to see. And tonight, we're going to concentrate on one of those birds. And that is the Great Skewer, a real Hander Island forte. This is the bird, big, bulky brown buzzard-like bird with that massive bill. Strong bird, dark brown with those golden flecks all over its body. Quite a beautiful bird. When it opens its wings, you see the patterning, the cream patterns on there. Now, the birds first bred on the island in 1964, and now they have an unbelievable 263 breeding pairs up there, so it's an increasing population. Now, they spend spring and summer up there, but then in winter they head south, they head off the northwest coast of Africa, off the Iberian Peninsula, and then they start heading back again, and they arrive back on the island in late March. And that's when they have to set up territories, and that is when some serious fighting takes place. You get aerial chases, and bear in mind that they, they pair up for life. Divorce is very uncommon, so both members of the pair will chase away intruders and they will fight fiercely. Once they get that opponent on the ground, they will peck away at it, feathers flying absolutely everywhere. And bear in mind that they return to the same site every year. So it's important, they know that site, they like that site, so they will keep all intruders at bay. And I know from experience that they will take on all comers. I was on St Kilda 20 odd years ago now, going up the hill thinking, well, I'm avoiding the skewers, they're over there, not knowing there was one pair on its own. First thing I knew was a big thwack on the back of the head. This skewer went over, drawing blood. So don't argue with the skewer. And once they've established their territories on the island, the next thing, of course, is courtship. And this is a far more gentle affair. They have parallel flights where the male and the female will fly together. She will hold the wing up, flashing that bit of creamy white under the wings. When they land as well, they'll often hold their wings up and call incessantly. And this is a, a warning for other pairs, for intruding birds to keep away, as well as being part of the pair bond. Then mating takes place. She bows her head down in a submissive gesture. The male jumps on her back, and then they mate. Cracking birds. Honestly, they, they, they really are amazing, amazing birds. Fantastic things. Now, when I was there this weekend, at this time of year, they're incubating their eggs. Invariably, they lay two eggs, and the nest, well, it's not really a nest, it's a scrape. It's on the floor in a position where they've got all-round vision so that they can see any threat early. And the eggs themselves, beautiful. Brown, olive brown eggs with those dark markings on them. And it's the female who does most of the incubation while the male is away getting food. It's a bit like our birds of prey, where the big female stays close to those eggs and the young to defend them, and the male goes off to provide her with food. How does he do that? What do they eat? We'll be looking at that later on in the week. Right, are you ready? With me now. Deep breath, right? Into the nose, out to the mouth. Come on. It's our mindful moment. And this time it's brought to you by Natalie Clements. And Natalie popped down to South Wales to the Newport Wetlands Reserve. And the next minute and a half is about the beauty of reed beds.
thank you, Natalie. Absolutely beautiful. There's something about reed beds. It's a monoculture, I know, and we normally like things that are more diverse, but there's a, they generate a real feeling. I love being out in the reed beds in the winter when the wind's blowing and they're whispering It's the to sound, one isn't it? The sound. Absolutely glorious, yeah. Now let's take a final look at our variety of nests because I think there's one you need to start looking out for, which is the swallow nest. Let's have a look at that live now because those swallows have completely changed since we first saw them. I mean, they almost look like adult birds and this is what they've been doing over the last 24 hours. They've been extremely active. They've been flapping. Let's take a look. They've been flapping and they've been wandering about. I mean, we actually thought that they were going to fledge because, as I say, I mean, they are out of that nest. We were holding our breath. So I would wager, Chris, that they're going to be gone by tomorrow because look at them. I mean, they are. They're, I can't they're, believe. They're, they're so ready. I cannot believe you're still thinking about losing more money. What, what, I'm going to have to open up a new account. Do you not seriously think they're going to be gone by tomorrow? I do not. I do not think they're going to be gone. I think they've got quite a few more days to go. I tell you what, let's go back to our view of all of those live nests. I thought I caught a glimpse of one of the kites eating, actually. What have we got there? I oh, know it's the buzzards, look. Look at the top centre. Can we go live to our buzzards? There's one of the adults there is feeding one of the youngsters. That's lovely stuff, isn't it? Look at that. Although I think that was a bit of distraction technique from you there because we were sense? talking about our wager and actually you do owe me the pound because it went to our judgment panel on social media and the mm. jury did judge mm -hmm. that actually with the lapwings versus the skylarks, the skylarks hatched first. There were two votes for you. That was from your dad and Megan, so hand over the pound, I won. <laughs> Take credit card. Yeah, all right then. <laughs> Sadly, that's all we've got time for this evening. What have we got coming up tomorrow? Well, we're going to bring you lots more of our raptors, and we will be focusing on those buzzards that we've just seen, because they've been developing very rapidly indeed. And I'm going to be bringing you more on Allerdale's red deer. And I'll be taking the time to sit back, relax, and enjoy the fabulous fans of tube worms. So plenty to look forward to tomorrow, and do keep your eye on our live cameras, because as I say, I reckon he's gonna be owing me another pound. Those swallows will be gone. <laughs> Send us in your comments and your photographs, and join Instagram at one o'clock tomorrow, where Hannah will be talking to Yolo. In the meantime, it's gonna be a lovely day tomorrow. Get out there and enjoy the wildlife. We will see you at eight o'clock again tomorrow. Have a lovely day. Bye-bye.